it's difficult if you have a disabled child anyway, but when you have an undiagnosed disabled child, you're incredibly isolated, both within wider society, but also within the disabled children's community. The geneticist is enabled to give you answers, answers that you desperately want. Why is he not doing these things, you know? What's happened? Is it my fault? It's scary, you're frightened, because you don't know what's gonna happen next. For thousands of children across the UK, living in limbo is a way of life because they have undiagnosed genetic conditions, illnesses and disabilities for which their doctors don't have any answers. They may be obvious, they may be invisible, but without a label, they're a barrier, limiting access to services and leaving unanswered questions for the parents who care for them. for children with disabilities in Cardiff, one thing separates Jonah from the other pupils. Despite his rather severe disabilities, Jonah is still without a diagnosis. There is a very wide variety of um, disabilities in our school, from Angelman syndrome to chromosome syndromes, and then to some children that have been born normal and through an accident have been brain damaged. So how does it compare with Jonah being undiagnosed? It, it doesn't make a huge difference because we treat the child as we see them, but it's nice to know that they've got a label. So you, you know that they've, they've got cerebral palsy, so you know what um, specific exercises to do with them what kind of things that they do like and what they don't like. So it's hard in that way to know what activities to do with Jonah to bring out the best in him. Jonah is six years old and yet he's unable to walk or talk and is fed through a tube into his stomach. Sometimes he seems oblivious to the world around him, but his doctors don't know why. This puts a strain on his parents who provide 24-hour care. You do have to fight for everything. I've never had anything just given to me on a plate. Um, I, I always phone calls, constantly chasing people um, to get things. So, you know, that, that just makes life more stressful. In an already stressful situation, you're already having to deal with the fact that you've got a disabled child. You're then constantly having to chase professionals as well to try and get what you need. She has to fight a little bit harder to get what Jonah needs. but. She's an amazing mum and she does the best for Jonah, so a diagnosis would be absolutely brilliant to have, but as, as he is now, she does a wonderful job for him. What sort of challenges have you faced um, because your child doesn't have a diagnosis? I think um, from a diagnosis point of view with Jonah, a lot of the time professionals, um, it's like getting this room for him. They, they assume that, oh, well, maybe he'll get better. We don't know what his prognosis is. He might actually be able to walk in three years' time, so let's not spend loads of money. Let's hang off and wait and see if he improves. And as a mum, it's just like, he's not, gonna, he's not suddenly going to be able to walk. Can you just listen to us? It's estimated that 12,000 families across the UK are in a similar situation. Parents who are struggling to find support because their children don't have a label. Nathan, who's seven, has learning difficulties and is the same size as his four-year-old sister. He receives little or no support from social services. Yet his brother Matthew has a very different story because Matthew has a diagnosis. Matthew's autism is textbook. Everyone understands autism. 
is doctors understand what's wrong with them, therapists understand what's wrong with them. Because Nathan has no set diagnosis, nobody knows what to expect with Nathan. So it's so much easier for everybody concerned to think, oh well, with Matthew, this, this, this will work because it's been tried and tested numerous times with various children. With Nathan, it's like, you write in a book, there's no back knowledge of, oh well, we've tried this before with a child, there's no other child like Nathan. And how does his condition affect the family? Everything revolves around Nathan he has that many different medical professionals involved in his care, you can guarantee there'll never be a time where it's suitable. In a lot of them, if you want to change them, it's impossible without another three month wait. So you've got to, everyone has to fit in with Nathan's appointments because you, you can't afford to wait another three months for a lot of them. How does the family cope with that? <sighs> they no, no different now. This is it. Research has shown that parents with undiagnosed children feel frustrated, isolated and powerless. For these families, Syndromes Without a Name is there to provide support when they need it. Especially at the moment when, you know, services are being restricted all over the place because of budget constraints. It's very difficult for families to get through those first hurdles to get social care support or to get educational support because they're being told they don't have a diagnosis so they don't qualify, which is ridiculous. You know, it's about needs assessment of that child, but in a time when things are being cut back anyway, a diagnosis becomes quite an easy way to filter out a certain number of families from the system. And, and kind of what role does SWAN play in helping these families? So SWAN stands for Syndromes Without a Name um, and SWAN UK is a support project that works with families with undiagnosed genetic conditions or syndromes without a name. And the basic idea is that we bring families together into a community so they can mutually support each other and information share. Um, we also work to just generally raise awareness but also to bring together interested or um, specialist professionals in this area so that we can start to build the body of information evidence around undiagnosed conditions as well. And this lack of knowledge surrounding these conditions seems to cause the main problems. Accessing support is a challenge for all these families, but for Jenny and Chris it's far more than that. From the day their son River was born, they haven't been able to relax, constantly worrying about his conditions. We first noticed there was something wrong, um, four days old. Uh, we were on our way out and he was in the back of the car uh, with you, weren't you? And he were shaking and he jerking. Got, yeah, he was getting upset and then we noticed his whole body jerking. It's like an electric bolt just going through his body that he can't control. So he was four days old and it just got worse and worse as the months went by. In and out of hospital, River's parents have watched him have lumbar punctures, brain scans and other tests to find out why he has seizures, why his development is delayed and what stops his breathing at night. His first blood test was when he was four days old. That was awful. We kept the, uh, the splint off his arm, didn't we? Yeah. Because we thought it was going to be a... A one-off. One of yeah, and we kept the, the give him like a wrist support. A tiny little for where he had his dripping. splint for him, you know, on his arm. We we're like, oh, it. can we keep that for his records, thinking it'd be the only one he'd ever have? And since that, he's had that many. I've lost count. Uh. But now, the decision to remove River's tonsils is weighing on his parents' minds. It's hoped that it would clear his airways, but his condition is so complicated that a routine operation becomes potentially deadly. We don't want to sign a consent form, really, when they don't know what's wrong with him. Yeah. It'd be difficult with Roxy, you know, she doesn't have the, the problems that River has, but it would still be a very difficult decision to say, yeah, she has to have general anaesthetic to have an operation done, because anything can happen. But to know that River has other conditions that could possibly be aggravated by it, because there's that many of them, even if there's a 50-50 chance, it's just, yeah. They can't say whether River will wake up or not. ENT actually told us, that's ears, nose and throat specialist, told us that if River has a central apnea, which is his brain stopping to tell his body to breathe, 
while he's under general anaesthetic, they won't be able to wake him up. So that's our biggest fear. Now we're going to Manchester Children's Hospital for Rivers ENT appointment. They think that if his adenoids and tonsils are removed, then it's going to help his apneas. But with him having the central apnea, is higher risk with the general anaesthetic. So we're going now to speak to the actual surgeon about the operation, if he thinks it will help from looking at Rivers' sleep studies. The Royal Manchester Children's Hospital sees 185,000 young patients per year. It will be up to both Rivers' parents and the hospital specialists to decide whether to take the risk or not. Jonah, Nathan, River and other children who are undiagnosed may seem to have very different disabilities, but doctors still believe that they have a genetic cause. This means that the problems originate in the building blocks of our bodies, our DNA. I've met up with Dr Julie Lloyd, a lecturer in genetics at the University of Essex, to find out how these syndromes are related. Hello there. Hello. Hi. I'm Kat. It's nice to meet you. Hiya. So, I've been meeting families with undiagnosed genetic disorders, but what's been confusing me is how our genes can actually cause the disabilities that a lot of these children are having. How, how does that work? Well, we have... Um whole set of, of genes inside every cell in our body and some of them carry out relatively simple tasks so they control um, very small uh, parts of our makeup, the colour of our eyes, um, whether we have curly hair or not. Um, but there are other genes inside our cells which have much bigger functions that actually control the process of development and development is what uh, controls the shape and form of our body, the structure of organs such as the heart or the brain um, and those obviously are, are very wide-ranging and, and important functions. So what exactly is a genetic disorder? Well a genetic disorder occurs when there is a, an error or a mistake in the structure of one of those genes and that then affects its function inside the body so it fails to um, control the process of development in the correct way. Now a lot of the families that have these undiagnosed conditions in their children, their parents aren't affected, um, other children in the family aren't affected. Why is it that this happens? Well the errors in the genes occur as the result of mutations and mutations can happen spontaneously in our cells uh, usually associated with the process of cell division. So when the cell um, needs to divide, it has to replicate and errors can occur so that the DNA isn't copied correctly and changes from a small single base, which is one of the chemicals that makes up the DNA, um, can take place, or larger rearrangements so that whole sections of DNA may be missing or duplicated. And so whether the problems are spontaneous or not is another unknown for our families. This means even more difficult decisions when planning for future children. Parents have to consider that their next child may be disabled, but it's also possible that a normal child could carry the faulty gene and then pass it on to future generations. It's this that was certainly food for thought when Hayley decided to have Jonah's younger sister, Martha. It was a very difficult decision to make because obviously the geneticist was able to, was only able to say, well, there's a one in four chance of having another child like Jonah because we don't actually know what's wrong with him, um, which again is still, you know, quite high and quite worrying, you know, that potentially one in four, you know, you, you could have another one like Jonah. So it was a huge worry and obviously it was a worry throughout the pregnancy that, um, you know, was this baby going to be okay? Um, you know, checking for club foot on scans and, and even after uh, Martha was born, constantly watching. And yet there is hope on the horizon for our families as they may have the chance to get all of their questions answered. And it's here at the Sanger Centre in Cambridge where it all began, where the human genome was sequenced, that the new study, Deciphering Developmental Disorders, is bringing hope for 12,000 children across the UK. The lead researcher of the study, Dr Matthew Hurls, has been telling us how his new technologies are bringing hope for the future. 
Uh, I'm Matthew Hurls, I'm a human geneticist uh, and I'm one of the leaders of the DDD project. So the DDD study is the Deciphering Developmental Disorders study uh, which is aiming to understand the genetic causes of severe developmental disorders in children and then with that information improve how diagnosis of those disorders is done in the NHS. So you say that you're using tests that aren't available on the NHS. Um, what, what tests are you using that differ? So the, the NHS typically provides two types of tests. It, it, it uh, provides a look across the entirety of the DNA for large segments that are gained or lost. Uh, and it does that at a relatively low resolution, so it will only identify if they're very large segments that have gained or lost or it uh, does, uh, performs tests for single genes. So if a clinician thinks, I think it could be mutations in this gene, then they'll order that particular test for that gene. Uh, the fundamental problem with that is that there's of the order of uh, certainly over a thousand genes that are known to cause developmental disorders. So the clinicians have to have a very tricky job in trying to identify which is the correct gene to screen. Um, we, but we now have new technologies that A, allow us to look at much smaller gains and losses of DNA um, that are currently invisible to the techniques that are used in, in uh, the NHS currently, but also to look across all the genomes, all the genes in the genome at once, uh, and not just have to select a particular gene. Much of the work is the computational because we see tens of thousands of variants in every single child that we'll look at, and we need to try and weed out those that are highly unlikely to cause the disease and focus our attention on those that are, are more likely to cause the disease. And unlike other research, the Deciphering Developmental Disorder study is also unique due to its interaction with the families through SWAN. How about these research studies? Are they providing hope for these families? Massively. Like they are the, the sort of beacon of hope. And I think it's been really interesting sort of seeing a community of families come together around the research. and. Um, with the DDD study in particular, we've worked quite closely with them since we started and the project team are fantastic in that they will sort of answer any questions we have. So we've set it up so that SWAN can very much be the sort of information front. So it means the families feel really involved in the research and you know, it's not just they're participating by giving their children samples, but actually they know that they can ask those questions, that they have a voice, that they're going to be kept informed. And then it's, it's crucially important for them. I mean, they're, they're ticking down the days waiting for that response. Um, Whereas SWAN um, has, is, from, from our perspective, uh, is performing a really useful role in, in collating together the concerns and the questions and the queries from the families uh, such that we can then address them and answer them and, and tell them about the project uh, in a more kind of interactive way than we've done in previous research projects. And so with studies such as DDD and technology improving, thousands of families nationwide are hoping that a genetic diagnosis is just around the corner. Their parents need a name for the conditions. We want a diagnosis so we can plan the future. Some people understand that, but then other people say, well, why label him? We don't want to label him. River's river, and that's who he'll always be. But it's the fact that if you've got a diagnosis, when you get all your forms and your paperwork and everything, you can write, River has such thing. I think having a diagnosis in a sense um, makes no difference to Jonah. He's still the same person, he's still Jonah. We're still gonna have to deal with the same things, but at least you know what you're dealing with and at least you know, well actually, it isn't anything I did. You know, this is the way he was born. The health services and the, the the things that are on offer and the things that are out there, they will only happen if it has a name. All I want to know is how Nathan will be in the future. That's all a diagnosis would mean to me is what can I expect? Because I know with Matthew, I know what I can expect as an adult for him. But with Nathan, it's just so unknown. But service-wise, that would mean yes. Someone will finally help. I may get some help with something overnight for sleep. But until then, I've got not a chance of anything.